Welcome to Gloria Day on this fourth Sunday of Lent. Pastor Greg and Donna are at the celebration of life for his uncle. Um, I hear that's in Texas. And uh, so they will be journeying home tonight. Uh, so we'll be here this week. But ask me to fill in while he's away. I am Laura. Please join me in the confession and forgiveness. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, who is good. God's steadfast love endures forever. Have a moment of silence to reflect. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, for people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Let us uncover our sin before the liberating light of Christ. Merciful God, we confess the folly of our sin and the hypocrisy of our complaints. We grumble about the evils in our world, even as we commit injustices and profit through deceit. We fret about the scarcity of resources while hoarding earth's goods and cheating the poor. We protest the problems of our world, but we do not actively work to address them. Merciful God, expose our sins before the light of your grace. Heal our sin and free us from your foolish ways, that we may know the joy of eternal life in Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Please stand for the opening hymn. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you.
Let us pray. O oh God, rich in mercy, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world and rescued us from the hopelessness of death. Lead us into your light, that all our deeds may reflect your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> comes from Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9, an introduction. Though God provides food and water for the Israelites in the wilderness, they whine and grumble. They forget about the salvation they experienced in the Exodus. God punishes them for their sin, but when they repent, God also provides a mean of healing, a bronze serpent lifted up on a pole. The reading. From Mount Hor, they sent out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take the serpents away from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. Here ends the reading. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. This one was a little easier for me to understand. <laughs> While we were dead in our sinfulness, God acted to make us alive as a gift of grace in Christ Jesus. 
We are saved, not by what we do, but by grace through faith. Thus our good works are really a reflection of God's grace at work in our lives. Now the reading. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Here ends the second reading. The Gospel today is from the third chapter of John, verses 14 to 21. Glory to you, O Lord. So last week we were in the Gospel of John also, John 2, where Jesus turned the tables in the temple, raising questions and probably the ire of the temple leaders. Um, immediately following this, Nicodemus, who is also a temple leader and may have been there when Jesus turned the tables, visits Jesus in the night. He comes at night to visit him. And our gospel starts us right in the middle of the conversation that Jesus and Nicodemus were having, but at a point where Jesus' instruction turns not just to Nicodemus, but to embrace all of us. Please join me in the reading. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Praise to you, O Christ. Be seated.
Snakes. Do y'all like snakes? There's a one. There's one. One back there. A few. Yeah, you all like some. I mean, some folks do like snakes. They keep them as pets, and they admire them in the wild. They spend a lifetime studying them. They bring them to elementary schools for wildlife outreach programs so that the next generation can love snakes just as much as they do. Clearly, I am not one of these snake-loving people. I have only seen a rattlesnake in person once. I was backpacking with a friend when we somehow surprised a rattler alongside a path. We stood stock still, hearts pounding. It stared up at us. We stared down at it for what seemed like forever. Eventually, it must have decided we would not make good prey and that we were not going to attack it, and it slithered away. I hope that that is my one and only rattlesnake, rattlesnake sighting in this lifetime. The story from Numbers that Diana read today is about snakes, or as our gospel renders it, poisonous serpents. Maybe vipers? This is a desert-horned viper, which lives in the Egyptian and, and Israeli deserts. I would not want to encounter this puppy any more than I would want to encounter another Arizona rattler. So the Israelites, as Diana told us, have been wandering in the desert for something just short of 40 years. God led them to the promised land, but they refused to believe it would be safe for them refuse to believe that the God who brought them out of slavery can be trusted to keep them safe in the promised land. And so they condemn themselves to wander in the desert. And they complain. There is no water. There is no food. And the food is awful. The grumbling goes one step further. They blame Moses, but they also blame God. Apparently, God is fed up with this lack of trust that God will provide for the Israelites, and so God takes his protection away, and the vipers begin to bite the Israelites. Again, the people come to Moses, and Moses prays to God. Does God take away the serpents? Does God keep the serpents from biting them? Does God render the serpents' poison non-venomous? No, no, and no. Instead, God tells Moses to make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. When the people are bit, they can look at it and they will survive the deadly bite. God doesn't get rid of the serpents. God doesn't keep the serpents from biting people. God doesn't make the serpent venom non-venomous. Instead, God asks the Israelites, as a community, to trust in him once again. All they have to do is look up. Look up at the result of their prior unwillingness to accept God's protection and provision. It's a strange story, and maybe we'd rather not talk about it. I would not mind never encountering, encountering another snake and never hearing another story about serpents, vipers, and snakes. But Jesus has a different idea. <laughs> when we turn to the gospel, Jesus reminds Nicodemus and the people of John's time and the people of our time of that time when the Israelites were being bitten. And Moses, and Moses lifted up the serpent on a pole, and those bitten could look up at the serpent and live. The serpent, this harbinger of death, the very beast that was killing the Israelites in the hands of God, saves their lives. Jesus tells us this is a good analogy for what will happen to him, that he will be lifted up on a cross, and everyone who looks up 
will have eternal life. The cross, that Roman instrument of torture and murder wrought against the occupied people of Israel. That cross in God's hands and proclaimed from the very mouth of Jesus is a reminder of the saving action of God. Just as the serpent on the pole showed the Israelites what was killing them, the cross shows humankind the thing that is killing us. Like the Israelites, we have already been bitten or are in danger all the time of being bitten. And what's biting us is sin. Not only our own personal sins, although they do bite us. I can certainly attest to that in my own life. But the sin that bites us, the communal corporate us, is the sin that is, is systemic in our world. That we perpetuate or we just allow to keep alive. Sin like injustice, oppression, racism. Because as these big systemic sins take root and grow in our society, those sins can almost not help but take root in us, poison us. But when we are able to tell the truth about our sin, as individuals, yes, but also as communities and societies, when we can say, yes, the snakes are biting, that is when that bronze serpent and the cross can transform from symbols of our brokenness to signs of healing and hope. When the Israelites looked up at the bronze serpent, they did not see another beast that would kill them, but instead they were reminded of the healing power and the love of God. And when we look up at the cross, this tool of torture and death, we cannot but face how depraved is the violence that humans will do to one another. 2,000 years ago and today. But we also come face to face with the Son of God. We are reminded that God can take even the most death-dealing parts of our world and find a way to make them into instruments of healing and hope. We are reminded of the depth and power and unfailingness of God's love for us. As Jesus goes on to tell Nicodemus, to tell us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. This one verse, John 3.16, is probably among the well, most well-known verses in the Bible. It is cited by chapter and verse alone. It shows up in many public places. It is seen on the apparel and even the faces of athletes. It's held aloft in stands at sporting events. It shows up in song lyrics and is even found subtly on fast food packaging. Because it's good news and it's so simple. John 3.16 has become a sort of shorthand, denoting the salvation of the bearer and the hope to evangelize the viewer so that they may also repent, be saved, and have eternal life. Now, the assurance of eternal life is most definitely a treasured promise. It gives me peace and comfort to know that not only will I be reunited with all of my loved ones in the hereafter, that I will sit at the feet of Jesus and truly understand this great cosmic story that I participate in but only dimly comprehend. And John 3.16 is also an all-inclusive egalitarian message. Educator, activist, and presidential advisor Mary McLeod Bethune, referring to the King James Version of John 3.16, writes, with these words, the scales fell from my eyes and the light came flooding in. My sense of inferior, inferiority, my fear of handicaps dropped away. Whosoever, it said, no Jew nor Gentile, no Catholic nor Protestant, no black nor white, just whosoever. It means that I, a humble black girl, had just as much chance as anybody in the sight and love of God. 
These words stored up a battery of faith and confidence and determination in my heart, which has not failed me to this day. That is a deep witness of the personal faith in salvation that this verse engenders. It is good news, but the good news of the gospel is so much bigger than what happens to us when we die. For me, unpacking this verse expands the notion of what good news it really is. We may be accustomed to read the so in God so loved the world, the Greek Otis as so much. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son. And God certainly does love the world so much. But the Greek Otis actually means in the manner or in this way. So it is more for God in this way loved the world that he gave his only son. Or here's how God loved the world that he gave his only son. Selflessly, sacrificially. In the way of the serpent on the pole, God's sending of his only son is another larger expression of God's love for his people. It is not so much about how much God loved the world, but it is about in what way God loved the world, the whole world. If our focus is on our personal salvation, that focus isolates our individual fate from the fate of our community, our society, and our planet. God gave his only son to come to earth not only to save individuals with the sacrifice of his life, but seeking to change the world and save the whole world. And we are called to participate in that saving of the world. And saving the world, living out our gospel faith, is to end injustice, to end oppression, to end racism, hunger, and hate, and replace it with justice, mercy, equality, plenty, and love. It is to do what is true. The verses that follow John 3.16 make it clear that it is not about a one-time altar call, but about entering into and following the ways of Jesus. Indeed, how else might we respond but to try to love the world as God does? How do we do that? Probably a lot of ways. Maybe by seeking to tackle global warming and caring for the earth, by tackling poverty and hunger in our community, by advocating for peaceful resolution of ongoing wars and provocations. And what else? Probably a lot of things. Because this eternal life that God promises us is not something that happens in the future, after we die. Eternal life begins now, every moment, and continues into all eternity. So as we as a community, as we gather at the foot of the cross, we look up to reckon with how and how well we accept God's love and good provision in our own lives, in our communal life, and in the life of the world. Amen. Please stand for the hymn of the day.
trusting in God's promise to reconcile all things, let us pray for the church, the well-being of creation, and a world in need. Gracious God, your love unites. Give vision to the global church and foster cooperation and mission. Increase interreligious understanding and ecumenical dialogue. Make your church a sanctuary for all fleeing persecution, disaster, and war. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Creating God, your love enlivens. Restore balance to the earth's fragile habitats. Preserve wilderness lands, rainforests, and wildlife. Cleanse oceans and rivers. Make us good stewards of the earth. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Righteous God, your love liberates. We give thanks for those who courageously witness to your liberating love especially Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth, renewers of society whom we commemorate today. Free all people from the evils of racism, religious strife, and hatred. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Merciful God, your love heals. Care tenderly for all those loved ones perished from pandemic disease in every nation. Strengthen health care workers, first responders, and caregivers. Relieve all those who live with chronic pain and illness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Incarnate God, your love enlightens. Open our hearts and minds to fresh understandings of our faith. Deepen our love for you and for one another. Teach us to pray for our enemies. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. At this time, we may offer intercessions aloud or in our hearts, finishing the petition with, Hear us, O God. We pray traveling mercies for Pastor Greg and Donna as they fly home tonight from Texas, give them safe flight and a safe um, and inviting welcome by all their lovely pets at home. <laughs> Hear us, oh God. Your mercy is great. Abiding God, your love saves. Those who died in the faith are made alive in Christ. We give thanks for your promise that we also will be raised to newness of life. Hear us, O oh God. Your, your mercy, mercy is great. great. Accompany us on our journey, God of grace, and receive the prayers of our hearts through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. always and also with you please exchange the peace with each other peace be with you peace be with you thank you peace be with 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 you. Peace be with you.
Let us pray. Holy God, gracious and merciful, you bring forth from the food, from, you bring forth from the earth and nourish your whole creation. Turn our hearts towards those who hunger in any way, that all may know your care, and prepare us now to feast on the bread of life, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the full awareness of your grace. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our trespass, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. For communion today, we'll, the ushers will guide you up the aisle to my right, and where I will meet you with the bread. There will be two identical stations for the wine on each side. If you would prefer to take communion in your seats, there are elements in the back on the green table. Um, oh, also, the, um, the darker color is wine, the lighter color is juice. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready.
We're going to have lost my place. <laughs> Please rise. Please rise. body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Amen. We'll just say that was the prayer. <laughs> One last chance. All right. Announcements. Is there Janet back there? I have two today. The first one is Wednesday at Pearl East, ladies' birthday at noon. Second one is Friday night, March 15th, Bunko at 6.30 and Please bring a white elephant gift to share. And I think that's it. Is there anything else, Nancy? Okay. not have to gather magazine we'll, there will be copies of the study that's what we use for it that will be Tuesday at 10 o'clock okay seeing no more announcements please stand for the blessing May the life-giving power of Jesus Christ's body and blood flow through your veins, flow through your lives, and flow through this earth. May this life-giving power bring healing and hope whenever there are wounds and brokenness. May the love of God, the grace of Christ, and the light of the Spirit bless you and keep you in the way of truth. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Go in peace, share your bread. Thanks be to God.